College, the College of Architecture, Planning, and Design. They honor Oscar Ekdahl, who was an architect in Topeka, a graduate of our college, and with a very generous gift, we've been able to sponsor lectures that bring the best leaders in design. The privilege of inviting a lecture passes among the different academic programs. And on behalf of the landscape architecture faculty, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Ekdahl Lecture featuring landscape architect Matthew Urbanski. We are really thrilled to have you here, Matthew. Um, it, it is not often that we're able to have a lecturer who can really demonstrate one of the values that we hold most important which is, I think, best explained um, through the little story that, as many of you know, Matthew Urbanski is a principal with MVVA. So he is in partnership in practice with his former professor from the Harvard GSD. And as I understand it, part of the reason that they are in practice together is because he argued with his professor during school. So that idea that we challenge ideas, that we're engaged in what we're doing, is really a wonderful thing to see demonstrated in the way someone can build their career. I also think it's great that he has um, been coined, he has coined two different phrases that I know that many of you have seen in the literature. Proposed existing conditions and permanent temporary conditions. So you can noodle on that for a little bit. Um, we are going to see examples of his work that I'm sure span um, all of the different places that he's worked in the United States and Canada and France. Many of us are, are very familiar with the Brooklyn Bridge Park and some of you have been able to visit some of um, the MVVA projects. So um, without any more delay, I ask you to welcome Matthew Urbanski. Thank, thank you. Um, is that microphone working for everybody? Is that good? I, I, I probably, Michael probably still wonders if that was a good idea, by the way. Um, but uh, we have a funny little thing showing on the screen here. Maybe we could get rid of that. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you all. Um, it's I think I've been in Kansas before because I was to the uh, Prairie Preserve um, and working on a project for uh, a project in, o in Oklahoma, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which I'll talk to you about. And um, so uh, what I, I'd like to talk about a few different things today. Um, uh, I'm, our practice really focuses on, um, I was just talking to a professor right before starting, and our, explaining that our practice really focuses on large-scale landscapes, really where the landscape is important, like in public parks um, and uh, campuses and things like that. But we really started our practice making gardens. And I think the, the, we're very grounded in the materiality of landscape architecture. And we still do do gardens, as well as urban design and parks and campuses and you know roof gardens and other things that people will pay us for. So the, uh, I, I think that you know, starting small and, and building up with the fundamentals is an important thing. But um, in terms of the, this, this, what does this title mean? Um, I've had the, priv the privilege of, of, of getting to work on some in parks that are very pivotal to cities and how they're starting to reimagine themselves. And I think that this is um, uh, kind of illustrated, the, the, the kind of battle that landscape architects can be participating in, in, in be, be with cities um, has to do, I think, with an observation that was made by uh, Edward Glazier in a, in a somewhat recent book that he wrote called um, The Triumph of the City. And he's talking about really the economics and, and the success of cities as a type. And um, I was talking to uh, uh, another professor earlier today about even your little, um, your, your main street here and how much more vital it is than it was over only just a few years ago and the interest in cities that people have and how she doesn't even need to um, have a car if she, didn't, if she didn't want to have one in, this, in the city. 
But uh, Glazier's point about, uh, about cities, which I think is very basic uh, economic point, is, is cities used to be a place where you had to live. If you uh, were going to you know, work on a, a, an assembly line making cars, or if you were going to sew clothes, or unload ships, or, or whatever it was, you, know, you had to go to a city um, because that's where the jobs were, if you weren't on the farm. And um, now city, that's just not true anymore. Um, there's a lot of different ways to work, a lot of different, you know, with all of the, mo the way the modern world is. And so now a city, your choice, you, you have a choice to live in the city instead of um, it, it being determined for you. And so cities, it's a conscious act for you to decide to live in the city, and many people decide not to because of that. Um, and so cities, uh, in order to be viable and vibrant places, are competing for customers, if you will. And so one of the things um, that uh, they do is they, they're starting to look at their public space and saying this is something, this public realm is something we can offer people that's better um, than another city or better than what they maybe could carve out for themselves in their own suburban existence or something like that. So landscape architecture, and on, especially on an urban scale, becomes very pivotal in this kind of economic argument about cities that um, I think is very empowering to our profession. So this idea of, a, of engaging space, these are a few different projects. Um, uh, I'll talk about some of these, but um, you know, an engaging urban space that, um, that you don't have to take care of, right? It's not your yard, um, but you get to see people, you can commune with nature, you feel part of a larger civic uh, space. This is, this is something that um, is happening in cities. And some of this follows, this is just looking at New York for a second, some of this follows, um, for instance, you see these long yellow lines here. These are new waterfront developments. This is where Brooklyn Bridge Park is, I'll talk about in a minute. The, um, you know, the uh, retreat, my, my friend uh, Ken Greenberg, who's an urban designer, has a great metaphor. I don't know if he made it up or, or if he just found it somewhere, but he, he calls um, what's going on in cities the retreat of the industrial glacier. Um, in other words, there's these spaces that have been opened up as the industry recedes in certain areas, for instance, in the waterfronts in many cities, especially in New York, revealing these kind of substrata, if you will, that are, can be recolonized and repurposed in this kind of um, battle that we're talking about. Um, of course, reusing disused space is not a, actually a new idea, like everything in landscape architecture. One of the great, wonderful things about landscape architecture is it, it, is it it's self-referential and it refers back to a very strong and successful past. And this is Bouchamont, one of my favorite parks. It's in Paris. Uh, you may or may not know that Bouchamont is made on the original plaster of Paris mine. Um, it was mined here. This is where the, term, where the phrase comes from. Then they dumped dead horse bodies in here. So this was kind of really pretty much a marginal space. Um, and now is, you might argue, the greatest park in Paris. It's certainly not the first one. That, it's not a repurposed royal garden like uh, the Tuileries or the Luxembourg Garden, which are, are also famous. But Bouchamont is an absolute must to visit. And it's an Alphonse project came about at that time. Um, or even in more recent history, Rich Haig's project to redevelop this former margin, this gas works park in Seattle, which was kind of part of the renaissance of park making. He was actually, like a lot of things with Rich Haig, way ahead of his time on this. And this was in the early 70s, where they, uh, he uh, not only said we should take a gas works and make it into a park, but we should even you know, make something about the archaeology of the gas works a permanent feature of the park instead of just smoothing it over and getting rid of it. Um, so this idea of parks as a catalyst for urban reinvention, I think, is a theme that's a very powerful one. And what, what do we mean by, you know, the, the other thing that is being um, uh, twisted and, and, and re-examined also is what is a park in its typical role within the city, sort of the paradigm of all parks, I could say as a New Yorker, of course, is Central Park. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's the perfect exemplar of the kind of late 19th century paradigm. By the way, it's the only thing I know that's as old as it is that still functions exactly as intended. It functions exactly as it was designed to function. It was, it was built 
over 150 years ago. You really can't name anything else that does that. There's almost nothing else that functions exactly as intended, even with the changes that it's had. So I'm not marginalizing it in terms of its success or validity, but this I the idea here is a kind of escape from the city within the city, right? And hell, that was a city that really needed to be escaped from, if you think about it, right? It was pretty rough with all these elevated tracks with steam engines on them and horse manure all over the place and industry and mess everywhere. You, you know, you needed a, an escape from that city within that city. And, and Olmsted came up with the perfect thing. He also realized that nature as a platform for democratic space, what, which was an unbelievable, in my opinion, an unbelievable mental, uh, intellectual leap to realize that, um, that nature uh, was a fantastic platform for, for uh, democratic space. Both of those things, I think, are still valid. But, um, but in our context, you don't always find 840 acres in the middle of an urban grid that's you know, ripe and ready to be made into a park anymore. That doesn't kind of so much exist. What you more or less come across are what I call former margins, things that were marginal, or maybe still are marginal, but now are considered, well, could we make a park here? And one of the former margins that um, I worked on early on at MVVA is this one, this is the site um, of Allegheny Riverfront Park. The other thing that came up in this paradigm was that we did this like almost every single one of our successful park projects. We did this for a private nonprofit group working in close collaboration with the government and the city. Okay? So this was citizens, the energy of, uh, of, of, of the private sector combining with the uh, resources of the public sector. And, and Carol Brown, who was the head of, a lot of these people, by the way, are women that head these consortiums. Um, Carol Brown, who was actually a New Yorker but lived in Pittsburgh, had an idea, which um, was that oops, we, we could make a park here. And if we made a park here, all of these buildings will be transformed from vacant and abandoned lots and it will become a vital edge to a new city. And back in the early 90s when she had that idea, it seemed mildly outrageous, except for the fact that it's, not, it's really a proven model. It's, it's worked before. And, um, you know, but you, go, you, go, you look at this and you say, where are you going to make a park, right? Um, and uh, I remember I, I flew out to Pittsburgh to scout out the site. And, and um, you know, some of they, they had this area here and this area here. And, you know, I approached it from Upland. I couldn't even find where it was. Um, and uh, I called back to the office because, you know, we didn't have cell phones yet then. And Michael said, um, so how's the site? I said, well, needs work. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, sure, it sure did. Um, so what, what we did is, is some major infrastructural moves. But my point about this being a former margin is this was an edge. This is not something in the center of the city. It's not really an escape from the city, although it works on that, it works that way to some degree. But what it also does is it, it winds up providing a very critical um, uh, set of connective tissue in, the, in a city that didn't exist before, where we're now connecting from the city down to the river, from the river up, and then also laterally along both lengths on there. And not, neither of those things were possible. This involves some major infrastructural work. Uh, we had um, major ramps that 300 feet long each. We needed to swing the walkway out around and into the river to get around the abutments. We relocated roads to create a park on the top here. So it was very large scale. So the top part wound up being kind of a civic scale thing and material and plant and stone material kind of responding to the classic civic landscape. And then the lower level park really responded to being in the river addressing the programmatic needs of boats. Pittsburgh has got, Allegheny County's got the most privately owned boats of any county in the United States that's not on the ocean. Um, so that was an early one of these uh, kind of um, projects. I, I want to talk about this idea, um, landscape imagination. Um, <clears throat> in a design school, uh, we tend to try to think that, or we're kind of taught that 
you know, design is design is design. You could be doing architecture, you could be doing urban design, you could be doing jewelry design, you could be doing graphic design, you could be doing landscape design. You know, it's all really the same thing. And, you know, and that's not really what they say, but it's sort of implied in a way too, right? And, and in a certain level, it is a little bit true. But on another level, I think it's important to recognize what is unique to your medium. What is unique to your profession, your, uh, the medium of landscape architecture? And I made up this phrase, landscape imagination, to try to embody that. Because wh what I'm trying to say is there's a certain capacity of the medium to do certain things. There's, a, there's an emotional capacity. There's a physical capacity. There's a connective capacity. There's a psychological capacity that the medium itself has that's intrinsic to it, right? That you can do better in landscape than you could do in architecture, right? Or graphic design or traffic design or something like that. And looking for those opportunities and exploiting them, I think is a very important part of being a landscape architect. Because landscape architects are asked to do things all the time where they're not gonna shine. You know, could you shrub up this dumpster please because we shouldn't have put it here, right? And so could you put shrubs in front of it? I'm being rude about it, but you know, that happens a lot, that kind of thing. That's not the best example of landscape architecture, right? Some shrubs around a dumpster. Um, and so finding, f finding the uh, uh, opportunity for and understanding this idea of landscape imagination I think is very important. Because landscape imagination, once you really understand the capacity of the medium, you could really start to imagine major transformations that aren't immediately drawn from the context. Because another thing we focus on a lot in school is context. Like we study the context and, and our solution is going to come out of the context. But if your solution is only going to come out of the context, then it's probably what's already there because that is what has already come out of the context, right? So uh, the context is very important and I really think about our projects as being working in collaboration with the site, but also through the filter of landscape imagination. What are the possibilities? So this is Wellesley College. This is a parking lot. Um, and this is, what we, this is only one year of growth after um, what we turned that site into, OK? And this is on top of a brown field that continues to filter toxic um, substances out of the soil underneath this landscape with a perched wetland that filters all the stormwater on the site, uh, way, way beyond just the site, about half of the campus. Or in Brooklyn Bridge Park, which I'll come back to, how do you transform something that at one point was a port like this and then through disuse became something like this, um, eventually into a park that would um, stretch uh, two miles along the waterfront in, in New York, and I'll talk more about that. Or here in, in Penn Park, this is, a, this is for the University of Pennsylvania where they had an idea of doing a, um, something they needed, which was athletic fields, reusing a site that no one even thought about, which is this site that was owned by the post office, actually, um, but then expand the program to say, well, it could also work as a city park or as a neighborhood park as well. You know, so it's not just a kind of privatized space for us. And so if you've ever been to the University of Pennsylvania uh, before this park was made, you never thought about walking from here to here, because it was impossible. It was a grade change, and this was a mess, and there were railroad tracks here, and railroad tracks there, and another set of railroad tracks there. But afterwards, because we were really thinking about this as a landscape, we were able to do that by combining land. You can't really see it so much in this, in this view, but we're really combining landforming and bridges to weave you up and down and through in an aerial connective tissue that then also becomes the uh, in, uh, in containment for some of these sports facilities. So <clears throat> what, is a, what is a tool of, how do you talk about landscape imagination to people who don't know what the hell you're talking about? Like, you know, people that you talk to in public when you're gonna go design a park. Because guess what? You don't design a park by yourself. You design a park and sell a park to lots and lots of people, everybody from the mayor or maybe even the governor all the way down to the people that kind of come up and bug you after public meetings. Everybody has to understand what you're about. And if they don't, and, and guess what? They're not landscape architects and they don't have any idea what you're talking about. So you can't just ask them what to do. 
That's preposterous. People pretend that's what we do. Like, oh, yeah, let's go ask the public what to do. That's ridiculous. It's like, that would be like asking your grandmother, you know, like, um, well, I, you could think of something. But um, so <coughs> where you should go on a date, I guess. Um, so anyway, uh, so what we did, and this goes back now nearly 20 years, is we started to develop a kind of, um, uh, a language, a, la a language of landscape that we call our landscape types. Sometimes it wind, they wind up get, getting called typologies, which is like an overly extended version of the word type, which just sounds kind of, you know, pseudo-intellectual, so I don't like that. But landscape types, types are um, a very valuable thing, okay? Because what it is, is it's talking about landscape as a medium having a use, okay? Because the, u the type is based in program or use. It's not so tightly related to form, okay? So you could have a type category that may have, be manifest in several different forms. And it depends on how general your type category is, okay? So what, when we start to design a park, we, were, we started to say, well, these people don't, know what the what what is the capacity of the medium what could happen here okay and also by the way your collaborators don't either you know the uh, the urban designers you might be working with or the architects they don't know about landscape either they think you put things on a site and then you put green stuff around them right derisively referred to by our office as parsley around the pig right that's not landscape architecture uh, that's parsley around the pig. So how do you avoid parsley around the pig? Uh, well, you understand that landscape itself has a purpose, has a use, has a function, okay? Besides decorating the pig, right? And uh, which is actually a valid use, but that's not one of my major types. So, ta so we're trying to, we're actually on a plane going to meeting, trying to think about what, what, what are these types? What are they going to be? What are we going to call them? And we had come up with um, three of them so far. We had the urban type, the natural type, and the civic type. And then we were thinking, well, there's this other thing that landscape can do. It could kind of approach, as Bachelard said in the Poetics of Space, a psychological immensity. It can create a space where there is a kind of uh, something greater than, than yourself. That is, uh, your, your uh, some room for your imagination to run around in, right? You see this sometimes in natural, in a national park experience, for instance, or in a in a sub it's a su it's an experience of the sublime, right? That's a capacity of landscape. So we're like, I had this picture, uh, actually almost exactly this picture, and, and I was like, Michael, what should this be? I'm talking to him over his seat in the plane. He goes. I don't know, how about the boundless landscape? So that's what it became, and it has been ever since. So I'll just go over from quickly, just so to kind of nail uh, down the idea of use. So the natural landscape is, the natural landscape is, a, is about, uh, the, me the metaphor is nature. It's about complexity, it's about seasonality, it's about change, it's about small, it's about texture, it's about scale, it's about systems, okay? It's about a living thing, it's about it being different in different seasons. Um, it's uh, about flows. It's about all that stuff that you learn about in ecology, right? Um, the boundless landscape, I kind of already blew it on it, I already told you this, the boundless landscape is a kind of avoid specificity. It connects to a larger, a, a larger horizon, for instance, um, and uh, 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 beyond the site. Um, I actually think the best boundless landscape that I know, designed boundless landscape, is the Long Meadow in Prospect Park that was designed by, um, that was designed by Olmsted and Vo. And if you go to New York City, and you should go to Prospect Park because it's actually the better of the two parks, like Olmsted and Vaux designed the first park, Central Park, made all the mistakes, and then they designed Prospect Park, where they really got good. And then it was in Brooklyn, so nobody cared about Brooklyn, so then nobody screwed it up. Benign neglect, very important thing, helped Prospect Park. So when they finally decided to resurrect the genius of Olmsted, Prospect Park was just sitting there unruined, mostly, almost unruined. Anyway, um, so the urban landscape 
is really more about the kind of the connection between whatever your park space is and the urban fabric. It's a kind of a transitional space. Um, and then there's the civic category, which I, I include a lot of things. I, call, I include playgrounds, I include sports fields, I include um, any play, uh, plazas, places where that are addressing that kind of civic need for people to come together and commune together in a democratic space. That's a civic space, that's a civic landscape. So this, so, um, <clears throat> okay, so what are some, I'm gonna try to talk a little bit about some other things that I think are within the capacity of landscape as a medium. Um, and one of my favorite things is that it can facilitate improbable juxtapositions. Um, this is our Hudson River Park in New York City, and um, we're moving out onto Pier 62. I'm not gonna tell you about the whole project, just wanna illustrate this point. So at this point, you just come in across the West Side Highway, a big multi-lane highway and bikes. So we wanted to decompress people, and we have this entry garden here, which you only see a part of. And there's cafe tables, there's a, a building nearby that has some place to get a cup of coffee. So there's a, a garden with lush flowers, cafe tables, kind of a decompression space. Immediately next to it is a skateboard park. Now, if you ask, if you're doing a planning exercise with a bunch of urban designers, and you said, well, I'm going to have a contemplative garden, and then literally 10 feet away from it, I'm going to have a skateboard park, they would say, well, that's not possible. They're incompatible uses. That's impossible. You can't do that. Well. Yes, you can, actually. It does. In landscape, you can do it. The funny thing about this, look at this picture. This is a picture of that. Here's people in the cafe tables. Then here's people on some path. Then this guy's riding his bike, and these guys are skateboarding. This is all like in a 50-foot transect. I don't think they even are aware of each other in this space. But they can be if they want to be. So, or this idea of kind of snow, uh, sledding in, you know, with a view of the Empire State Building. Right after the skateboard park is a carousel, okay? So talk about another uh, improbable juxtaposition. It's a carousel designed for little kids. All the creatures on it are uh, in, uh, kind of fanciful versions of creatures from the Hudson River, except for the unicorn, which you can see there. That was because the park director wanted a unicorn, but otherwise everything else. <laughs> Is, is there. So there's uh, seahorses and otters and a black bear and all kinds of things. And then after that is this, this kind of boardwalk contemplative space that you walk out and you go all the way to the end and you can look all the way down the river and see the Verrazano Bridge and the statu <laughs> Statue of Liberty. All those four things are within a six or seven hundred foot transect across the park. Or this is in Union Square Park in a play space that we made there. This um, I so adore this woman, that photographer that took this picture. She, what, what you realize in landscape architecture is it's very, very hard to take pictures because our, our, our medium is really about movement and time and space and a picture is just a moment. Um, and so you go through a lot of photographers trying to find somebody who understands even slightly what you're trying to do, you know, pointing their camera for them and all this kind of stuff. And then uh, if you're really lucky, you meet somebody like Elizabeth Felicella who understands what you're doing well enough that you just send her out to the site and she comes back with stuff. And that's what she, she really captured what this space is about. Um, look at the different things that are happening here with this, these kids of a certain, uh, playing with one kind of thing over here, there's a sandbox over here with a bunch of other kids. And then there's these little toddlers on the tot swing and this is the entrance to this section right here. And this kind of Dawn Redwood tree in, in the middle is one of the things that helps that all work. Or um, here, this is Hoboken Pier Sea Park where we designed a, an island and programmed the island. And I think one of you, one of the, I'm going to talk a, a bit more about programming, but the kind of juxtaposition of uses here is not something that would come out of a textbook in terms of making an island and juxtaposing plants and teenagers all together like that. Okay, so <clears throat> um, I think one of the one of the uh, other things that the themes I'm talking about here is that the landscape types are about is they're about the medium, okay? What's the program? The landscape's the program. 
It's, I don't need to put something else into it, although it's fun to put something else into it, like a basketball court or a skate, skating rink or a cafe or something like that. But fundamentally, the landscape is the program. And one of the places that kind of illustrates this as an idea is a tiny little park that we did in Battery Park City called Teardrop Park. Now, it, you can get an incredible lesson in the kind of the trajectory of public space making in New York City um, by walking up the west side. Okay, so you really need to do that. You need to go down to Battery Park City, which was a development made. They filled in part of the river before the creation of the Clean Water Act. And they just made a new piece of city where there was just water. And one of their ideas, after they went through several bad ideas, one of their ideas they came to finally was to make it a garden city. And so it, it's about 80 acres, and about 30 acres of it is landscapes and gardens. But the funny thing was, they didn't really know what to do. This is, my, this is my take on it. They didn't really know what to do because no one had made anything of any significance in terms of a public space in New York since for a long time, okay? Since the Depression, basically. Um, and, and, you know, uh, and in general, public space making by landscape architects had very much atrophied in the middle of the, of the 20th century. What were landscape architects doing? They were out in the suburbs making beautiful John Deere headquarters landscapes, right? That's what they were doing, right? They were doing, they were making, you know, uh, GM testing grounds. They were doing um, all of those iconic landscapes that you've seen, but all the stuff that Dan Kiley was doing with Eero Saarinen and, and Sasaki and all those firms, right? They weren't in the city because there was nothing happening in the city. Why wasn't there? Because everyone was moving out. The peak, we have finally matched 1958 population in New York this year. Okay? New York lost population from the late 50s until we finally caught up with it this year. Guess what? Chicago's still losing population, has been. We don't like to talk about it because it's depressing, but they've been losing population continually even with the new building that they have there. So cities need to uh, you know, th rethink that. But anyway, down here in Battery Park City, I don't, I don't think they could figure out what to do. So they started re relying on certain, certain tropes, on certain crutches, okay? Like, um, so the first thing they did is Lori Olin designed the Esplanade. And the, es and the, cr the crutch there was history. They designed a, an esplanade that looked exactly like it was designed in the 1930s. Okay? Exactly. Like it, it was like a stage set. So the, hi the crutch there was history. Um, so, uh, later on, Susan Child did, I thought, was, was the, 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 bo the boldest thing in South Cove where she made this abstraction of a rocky shoreline uh, rolling down into the water. But she was forced, this is my word, not hers, forced to work with Mary Miss because we needed creativity and landscape architects weren't considered creative enough. So we needed to have a famous bossy artist, right? Mary Miss, so she made this platform that looks, I guess, like the Statue of Liberty's crown or something. And, you know, went around giving lectures about how uncreative landscape architects are, okay? This is what you guys don't have to put up with. It's what I had to put up with when I went to school. But you don't, okay? So, so artists, we needed artists for creativity. We needed history for an excuse. We needed architects. Oh, yeah, this is an artist-designed space called the Irish Hunger Memorial. It's like a joke, like literally. It's like, look, I took a piece of Ireland and dropped it at an angle in New York. That's it. There's nothing more to it than that. Um, or they made super traditional playgrounds, like this really wonderful playground in, 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 um, in um, Rockefeller Park. So one of the cool things, was, we kept trying to get jobs in Battery Park City, and we never could. And then they got to the last spot, Teardrop Park, which was going to be inside the middle of all these 30-story high towers. And Everyone had like gotten over all that other stuff. They ran all that through their systems, artists and all that stuff. And they said, we want you to design a space for children. A space for children, but it can't be a traditional playground. 
No, actually, they didn't say that. They just said, we want you to design a space for children because we don't have enough spaces for children in Battery Park City. And the head of Battery Park City said, oh, and I, and I think it should be inspired by upstate New York because I'm an upstate New York Teddy Roosevelt Republican, and the country was good for me, and the country would be good for the kids in New York City. And you kind of think like, Bleh. That's ridiculous, right? <laughs> How simplistic. Until you realize that, and he was talking about the Catskills, by the way, until you realize that that was the exact same landscape, exact same landscape that Olmsted said Central Park should be based on, the Catskills. And I don't think he knew that. I'm sh pretty sure that Tim Carey didn't know that. So. Um, you know, clients say crazy things, and sometimes they don't turn out to be that crazy. Um, so this is a tiny space that, in any kind of objective urban design analysis, you look down on the plan and say, this should be an oval, right? And you walk in, it's an urban room, right? Well, what, what would happen if it was an urban room? Is you'd walk in, you'd look around, and you'd be done, right? You'd see the whole thing, and it would be over, okay? So what we realize, and, and this picture is actually a little deceiving because you see the buildings more in the picture than you do in your experience. But what we realize is we, if we made, if we played with this idea creatively of Tim Carey's of bringing the Catskills into New York, there was nothing here. This is filled landfill. It was flat, okay? Nothing. Not like Central Park where there were rocks and stuff already. If we played with this idea, we could make a space that felt way bigger than it actually was. That's one of the capacities of landscape. We could control views, we could unfold uh, sequences of space by making very exaggerated landforms using all kinds of high-tech technology, geotextiles and whatnot, geofibers. We can make a space that prevents you from understanding the limits of the space. You cannot understand it when you walk in there. And therefore, people guess that it's actually twice the size that it is. And then they want to go and explore and move from space to space. Um, this just shows our construction of that main element through the middle, which cuts the space in half, which is our ice wall, um, and speaks to a little bit the collaboration with the um, quarry owner, who is also an artist. This is um, obviously very inspired by uh, geology textbooks. Um, and, uh, and I think the success of the, of the stonework in, in, in um, Teardrop Park comes from the fact that it, it, it's in, it seems to be inspired by nature, but it's not a polar bear tank, okay? You can, if you know what you're looking at, you can tell it's built. It's made of pieces of quarried stone, reassembled. There's a kind of creativity to it on that level. Do people go there and think it's natural and they built the buildings around it? Yes, I've taken people on tours there. And they're like, so how much of this stone was here when you started? You know, that's like a question they ask. See? And, and, and then other people look at it and they think, wow, that's amazing, the kind of tectonic of it. You know, so there's a tension there, which I think is key. There's a wall that oozes water all season. So in the summer, it's just dripping water. And then in the winter, it freezes over and becomes a passive ice fountain. And you move through tunnels that draw you through the space. And um, it's also a miniature landscape. So there's a very deliberate manipulation of scale. Um, and it's supposed to be for children. This is a small adult, um, New York thin adult. But the, uh, um, the plants, for instance, are all large shrubs or small trees. There's hardly any full-size trees. There's some uh, birches here, but there's very few small full-size trees in the whole park because they would kind of reduce the scale of it once they kind of you know, let you know the real size. And there's these spaces that are very intense and, and small and lush. This is a little marsh garden. These kids were just in there with their lightsabers. The whole thing, this whole marsh garden is as big as the, f the front of the hall, the hall here, like between the front row and the screen. It's tiny, but they don't know. I love the devilish look on that kid's face. <laughs> and then you walk around the corner and you see this crazy slide, which is the only explicit piece of programming, quote unquote, in the whole park. Um, 
uh, it, this just shows this. The, um, th one of the things in order to c create all this complexity is we have a kind of a whole set of plant communities, a whole set of soil types that we're creating, and a whole set of different plant moments that add to this kind of collage of experience as you move through the space. And we make up evocative names for them, like the Witch Hazel Dell and the Hellebore Hill and the Beech Grove and, um, you know, some things are normal, like Marsh, Shadbush Knoll. These are evocative names that start to kind of power your creativity. There's the ice. There's the marsh garden looking through to the wall. So the, the plan's mildly demented looking, actually, isn't it? I mean, it's not designed in plan at all. It's totally designed in the experience of moving through the space and working three-dimensional models to, to develop that. So now I want to talk about four big parks, and I'm going to try to go as fast as I can here. Um, and uh, in terms of this idea of cities trying to bring in a new park to kind of push it to the next level, okay? I'm going to start with Maggie Daly Park. Um, you might have seen this park. Uh, if you Google it, you'll see articles about the ice ribbon, which, is, which I'll show you in the middle, but it's partially opened, which is sort of semi-nightmare for any, anybody who's built anything knows that you don't want your landscape to be open before it's finished, but they couldn't resist, so it is. Um, and, you know, you can't complain, but... So this is North Grant... I mean, this is Grant Park. This is Chicago. This is Grant Park, Chicago's front yard which is honestly as empty a statement as that sounds. Um, and because this is not anybody's neighborhood, really. This is the business district, okay? And so a lot of Grand Park with beautiful fountains and uh, pseudo-French-inspired, in you know, layout. Not actually French. It's rather flat. Um, French landscapes aren't actually flat. You should know that. Um, you know, is... Uh, it's a, it's a kind of parade ground, really. You know, they have Lollapalooza there, right? It's an event space. It's sort of a chronic problem with, mid, with Midwestern parks because a lot of people don't live in Midwestern cities. They only work in the city and then they go home. So the parks are sitting there without a community around them or that has been a problem. What's happened, so what happened though is um, our site is this one, okay? It actually goes all the way to here now. For a long time, there was train tracks right here, and then they built Millennium Park. So you've all heard of Millennium Park. That's right here. And then there were train tracks up here, and this became a neighborhood up here. And there's big residential towers here. So this site, which was called ba Daily Bicentennial Plaza, which had basically no program and no neighborhood, now is connected by Millennium Park and has a neighborhood. So our thought was it should be different. So here's Daily Bicentennial Plaza. Lucky for us and lucky for Chicago, the 40-year-old water, waterproof proofing started leaking. And so they needed to rip this park off and put a new one on. 2008, they had an RFP out for that. There's an also a garden here that's built on the easement of the old Lakeshore Drive, and then there's this place called Peanut Park over here. This is the Frank Gehry BP bridge that swirls onto the site. That used to be called the bridge to nowhere because there was nothing going on here except for four tennis courts that were almost never used. That's our design for it, little different. Um, although you'll notice that the grid work of the underground garage um, still registers through because we didn't, couldn't restructure the whole garage or redo the ventilation of the garage. But the main motivators, the, the title of this was Park Programming and Circulation as Engines of Design, okay? Fletcher Steele, landscape architect that you should learn about, one of his, a line that's attributed to him, I think it's one of his lines, is circulation is the engine of design. Um, to not think about the circulation in your space and how a space is revealed through circulation is, is like being a doctor but not taking anatomy, okay? It's just ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. It's the most basic thing that you have to do. And so connect it, how your space connects and how you move through it really started to inform this. And then um, the programming. 
this was kind of out, you know, Millennium Park is kind of spectacular already, so one thought would be, well, maybe this park should be more passive then, because it's moving towards the lake. We kind of wound up having sort of the opposite thought of that, and uh, which was that we should put some fantastic programming in here that will draw people across the BP Bridge, but that will also serve the immediate neighborhood. So we have a kind of more passive central picnicking lawn this way. And then on the north end, we have what we call Winter Wonderland, which is an ice ribbon around rock climbing hills and a, and a, con a concession. And on the southern node here, we have a nearly four acre play garden. So the, the main axis this way, the more quiet axis for the old people, um, is based on lawns. A lot of people wanted it all quiet like it was before. You know, one of the weird dynamics you get in public space design is people don't want people to go to the public space because then they might be loud and keep them up at night, which, you know, can be a legitimate concern. So these are precedent images that we used in our public presentation. This is Brooklyn Bridge Park, and what we are showing here is one of our big ideas, which is moonlighting, lighting the entire park instead of just the paths. And we wound up doing that in Maggie Daly. This is the Long Meadow and Prospect Park that I mentioned. Kind of don't totally get the boundless experience with all those people in it. This is our Hudson River Park. So this is a view that we made of that axis looking down it. The park was very poorly connected before. This Literally this kind of grade change separating it, um, uh, inaccessible pathways and whatnot. So, Remember, circulation is the engine of design. So we went from something like this with literally path work that looked like it was drawn robotically to somehow reflect the garage structure below, right? Because where is this path going? Or that one, 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 or that one. You know, and no connection to a corner in a city? That's very strange. So our whole thing started to be driven by how people might move through the park to go over to Navy Pier and then how they would experience the park itself. So this, the, the, and then the bridge and the curvaceousness of the bridge also becomes a big inspiration. And then the undulation of the meadow and how you move through that, these are all meet, uh, drawings that were done to sell the park. And then on the other axis, I explain those two programs. So we'll go into the top here at, I think we got the job because of the idea of winter wonderland. Um, we said, you know, this is a park in Chicago, it's cold in Chicago, you got a long winter, you should draw people to the site in the winter and it, with energetic programming that will be exciting and keep them warm and, and celebrate the winter. And so we came up with this idea of an ice ribbon, which is a, literally a, ribbon, a, a linear path of ice that slopes and curves. So, and there are these mountains, these abstractions of mountains in the middle that, uh, by the way, hide some of the vents and stuff and that cooling system for the ice ribbon. And they become a rock climbing feature. And then the whole thing is ensconced in evergreen trees, which is also weird because they don't have evergreens in Chicago. So that goes along with the fantasy of, of the winter wonderland. But it needs to work in other seasons, so it's also uh, a skating track in the summer. And then uh, a skating of uh, ice ribbon in the winter. The idea is that you can walk right off, skate right off the ribbon and get a hot cocoa in this concession over here, which is gonna happen. There were skating ribbons that existed. We talked to the engineers that made these um, and uh, this is one of the boards we made to sell the idea. This is uh, some rock climbing precedents we showed. Um, and uh, I'll show you the skating ribbon in, in, in actuality in a minute. This is, so this is down at the other end. So the, the, the play garden is, is, consists of several garden rooms that are uh, tailored around different themes around this wave lawn. So I'll just, there's the slide crater, which is, um, and well, that's not actually the slide crater, but that's the sea over here, uh, where there's a lighthouse and a boat. These are early, and then you're looking over to the slide crater with uh, suspension bridges and slides. These are some of the elements we wanted to use in there. We, we collaborate a lot with some German play equipment makers. Uh, the play uh, 
equipment made in Germany, especially, but in Europe, tends to be more interesting, um, probably because they have about one-tenth the number of lawyers per capita in Germany than they do in the United States. And about two-thirds of what they make in Germany we can't actually bring to the United States because it doesn't uh, conform to our, our, our um, guidelines that we've made that cities have now turned into law, even though guidelines were made to be guidelines. Now cities, you know, thinking they're doing the right thing, then say that the guideline is a law. So then if somebody gets hurt on your thing and it somehow could be seen to be in violation of a guideline, you've broken a law that was not intended to be a law. So we have the, the wave lawn and, uh, and this what we call the garden of surprises, several rooms that you go through here. And, uh, and another piece called the enchanted forest. And these are th elements that we wanted to have in there. So this is some construction photos. Um, so his, this is Daily Bicentennial Plaza. There was a skate, skating uh, area here. Almost no one went to. And there was some tennis, and there's Frank Gehry Bridge coming in, and this is mindless formalism. This is it after it's been all stripped off. It was a shame that we had to take away 40-year-old trees, and we wanted to reuse them, and it was just beyond the project budget to transplant them and bring them back on. But I'll show you how we did re wind up reusing some of them as elements in the park. Stripped down to its base, um, waterproofing going on, and then this became, I think, one of the largest, if not the largest, project use of geofoam ever. We had three different suppliers supplying geofoam to the site in order to deliver enough on time. Geofoam is a way of creating topography um, without practically, essentially, no weight. Because we had, I would say that this is the most technical park and tech, uh, technical challenges of any park we ever designed. When you think about the geofoam, the loading, the waterproofing, all the, the play uh, stuff, which is extremely technical, the ice ribbon, the rock climbing, the concessions, um, very, very, very complicated. So coming on here, more um, geofoam. A later picture where the fill is starting to be placed. This, you can see some of the landscape of the play area coming together here. We see the ice ribbon coming together, some of the steel structures of the climbing structures coming into in here. And yeah, it's open. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so vast areas that are not done, uh, but um, 700 people on the ice ribbon, and this is the line for it right here. Um, and it costs $12 to rent skates to get on it, by the way. I figured out by early, like by, by January 5th, they had already made $350,000 in skate rentals on it. But the, and this is the plague garden, which is also open, except for the parts that aren't open. Um, there were so many, I took my kids there at Christmas week, and there were so many people in the park in the middle of Christmas week that my, my kids were just too scared to play on anything. We had to come back. And it was just as many people the next time, but they were used to it, so then they did it. So, and the lighting, uh, you could see the moonlighting on the lawn spaces here. And then the lighting on the ice ribbon was, I think, done really well by Domingo Gonzalez Associates or light, light, lighting designers out of New York City. The light is suspended over it. The only one of the cl climbers is built. This one's not done. So the trees, we wound up reusing some of the trees as elements in the park. Um, we harvested them um, and we stripped them and um, seasoned them and made them into upside down trees um, in the enchanted forest. So that's not done yet, but that is going to be this kind of fantasy scape of upside down trees and, and living trees, of course. This is a giant rock that rotates on a single point here. Only something Germans could make. A child, a child could turn a, a literally a, a boulder, a giant boulder, and spin it around with their hand. <clears throat> and this is just developing um, play uh, features. We had this idea for a C, early sketch, and then a computer model that the manufacturer made. We went to Germany and did our research here. We are, 
that's me, and this is our, cli this is our client for another project, coming to see them making the boat for Maggie Daly Park. This is Peter Hoykin from Richter, the, uh, the company that's making this stuff, other people from the office, and, and the boat there, and then the boat in, in Chicago. Um, and then just some of the topography. It's it kind of neat. It's like you're making an actual full-scale contour model. You see that? This is the view from the terrace looking down to the Buckingham Fountain. This will be uh, ice, uh, you know, rock climbing features. This is structure that is totally hidden that transfers loads to existing points on the garage. This, this is our rock climbing wall eventually, which frames the view of the fountain in the distance. The, um, just this, the coordination between the garage construction and renovation, which by the way was done by a separate contractor, and needed to be done ahead of time before the design of the park was finished, but all these foundations needed to be coordinated. That was a giant nightmare. Um, and then the technology of bringing the soil out onto a, onto a deck that you can't really drive full-size trucks on. So this use of um, telebelts, um, I don't have a picture of it here, but conveyor belts that went for hundreds of yards, lightweight trucks with big tracks, that's what that thing is there. All kinds of neat stuff. Okay, so um, this is, I think I, I alluded to this, I'm proud of this subtitle on here. Um, embracing landscape's capacity to delight. I think, you know, in school, we want to take ourselves seriously. We want to talk about metrics and science and measurement and, and everything and saving the world and capturing stormwater runoff and all of those things. Those are very important things, but guess what? You don't need landscape architects really to do that. Just those things. You don't. You could have civil engineers do it. You could have foresters do it. You could have, I don't know, somebody else do it. Land, landscape architecture would not, it's my opinion, landscape architecture would not exist if there wasn't landscape delight. If there wasn't beauty and delight, why would you need, why would, why would any of this stuff been made, right? This is about, this is things that could do all of that stuff I was just talking about, but what does it mostly do? It engages you and it draws you in and it makes you love it, right? It's about the capacity of landscape to delight. I think that's very important. And you need to figure out what it is about landscape that you think not is just important to you, but would be important to other people. You can translate and then you would draw in other people. You know, it is important what you want to do with it, but like if it's just some designer's conceit, like just some funny, you know, thing that you like. That might be, that might work, but might not. I have to tell, all right, I don't have time for that story. Um, okay, so anyway, this is why you study landscape history, because you need to see all of these incredible accomplishments in landscape delight. All right, so Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now there's a rough place for making a landscape, okay? We have... Uh, 50 days over 100 degree temperature two summers ago in a row. Uh, we have tornadoes, we have ice storms. It's just really, really rough. Also, Tulsa is, is despite all that, is kind of a garden city. Everybody lives in a single family house, or a lot of them do, and they all have their own little private Idaho in their backyard. So why do they need to go to a park, right? They got their little chimichia or whatever it's called, right? And they, they don't need to go anywhere. So what are you gonna do? Well, we have a client, George Kaiser Family Foundation, another private nonprofit. This is a philanthropy. This is the largest privately funded park ever in the United States. Um, bought this land and this land, and then this is city-owned Riverside. This is the Arkansas River, and this is city-owned property. And they put out an RFP, request for proposals, that they would like Firms to respond to making a gathering place for Tulsa. That's it. That's what they gave you. This is the site, although they didn't say 
what of the site you should use or how you should use it or anything. And they didn't say what to do on it. They said, make a gathering place for Tulsa. So, programming this, imagining what it would be, was our job. Just like it was at Maggie Daly Park, you know, in collaboration with the Parks Department. And not exactly like it was in Teardrop, but somewhat. Coming up with the program. So an architect gets a commission to design a house. What does the owner do? Gives them a piece of paper. I want three bedrooms. I want a dining room that connects to the kitchen. I want, you know, four and a half baths, blah, 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 blah. And then they, that's the program, right? And then they do it, right? What was the program here? I don't know. You guys figure it out. Okay? So we had to completely invent what this was. Then the site had a lot of challenges. It had a very steep relationship to the river. There was a channel, like a channelized stream through some of it. There's a, a railroad bridge that was a, a, bike, uh, a bike way that you couldn't really use very well. Um, there was neat things. There were, that railroad bridge gave a great view of the river. You could go down into this very rough, rocky riverbed. There was a cool power plant across the way. Um, so it had assets and liabilities. But, so here's the site. And I think we won this competition, first of all, because we said this should be one site. We should not develop three different ideas for this, but we should somehow blend all of these sites together so when you're in the park, the felt experience of the park was one continuous, varied but continuous flowing space that also connected to the river. Oh, there's a little problem there. There's a four-lane highway between the sites and the river, right? Also a dam here. So. That's the kind of diagram you make that even people in the public can understand. <laughs> I was very proud of the Keith Haring hash marks on here. That was my idea. <laughs> Boing! I, that one's these sound effects, right? Um, four disconnected areas, one park. Everybody gets that, right? And then, you know, it didn't have a lot going on on it. It should have a lot going on on it. Okay? That's what that idea is. Don't. And so... What we wound up doing is thinking about major um, flows of space that would start to connect the sites together with the riverfront and create this kind of large armature like that. And then that becomes populated with an actually considered set of dots, not like just random gumballs like that other diagram had, right? That's related to the location and program and all of the kind of things that we started to figure out. Because what this is about, in a way, is I, 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 I kind of laid out a, a, tough, a tough audience, like, you know, what do they need? Well, actually, they have a lot of missing experiences. They actually have a lot. And a park, I think all of our parks, we strive very hard to find the missing experiences in the target audience's lives and fill them in, especially missing experiences that we could we could um, come to bring to fruition um, better than in another way, right? In another venue. So the big idea wound up involving land bridges that are 600 feet long each that connect the um, waterfront to the land. And here we are working. We make everything in models, um, which are great for us to figure things out. Um, and also great to communicate with the public. And this was a 16th scale model of the whole park. It was about 30 feet long when it was done. And here it is in a public meeting. And people, I've already figured out that people in Kansas are really nice like people in Oklahoma. So I, tell, I would tell people, that I've already figured this out. I've only been here a half, you know, feels like a half hour, but I already figured that out here. Um, I would tell people in these meetings in Oklahoma that being my, you know, cranky New Yorker that I, I, love, I love to come to Oklahoma because I could learn how to be nice again. <laughs> but unfortunately, they just think I'm pulling their leg. They don't, because they're always joking too, so. Anyway, this is Michael, you know, doing the presentation. So, 
this idea of a, a multiplicity of circulation ways, really a whole variety of ways of moving, connecting, all kinds of experiences kind of captured in this diagram. And I'm just going to walk you through the gathering place for Tulsa uh, here. We'll start up here. We're coming at this entrance. Um, you know, Tulsa is a car city, and so we have parking all the way around the edges here. Instead of like one giant parking lot or an underground structure or something like that, which was very out of character, we kind of put it all around here and then little spots off of the highway along the length of it. So you can go, once you know the place, you can kind of go to where you want to go and get quite near it. When you guys have kids, you'll know how important that is, okay? Um, we, make it, we had this idea of a lodge. The lodge kind of alludes almost to a residential architecture. It's actually a, a civic scale. But the idea of extending the use, like I already said, how hot it is in the, win in the summer, it's really nice a lot of the winter. Getting people into the landscape in the winter is great, especially if they know they have a refuge. And so the idea is the lodge is a refuge in the winter. This was one of our competition drawings, actually. We're collaborating with Max Scoggin and Merrill Elam, who are architects out of, of Atlanta. And this is a drawing we did in collaboration with them. They really, they obviously drew the building. Um, but this idea of this, uh, this kind of space that you could enjoy the landscape and know that it's there and will go warm up. Um, they also, the real s social space besides church in Tulsa is restaurants. And so there's two places to eat in the park. This is um, a beer garden that's next to the lodge. These are some study models of looking at how the beer garden would kind of work around existing trees and flow out of the lodge um, various, at various scales. Then kind of segueing from the lodge into the park, as you move down, we, the other big move besides connecting the space with land bridges was an idea of digging out the whole middle of the site and taking a site that's flat and ultimately giving it 70 feet of grade change. It will have 70 feet of grade change in the end. We dug a pond in the middle all the way down to groundwater, which is what you see here. And there's a garden coming out of the lodge, which we call the Miss Mountain. We have just shameless names for things. Um, that takes you up where water jets will mysteriously jump up the hill to a high point here and then flow back down little runnels and channels back to these koi ponds. What you don't know is you'll get to the top and then descend into a grotto that overlooks the water. Who doesn't want to make a grotto, right? Like, when are you going to get to make a grotto? When they don't give you a program. Like, I think you need a grotto. I think you guys need a grotto. When I showed this picture in the public meeting, and I said, and this will be the view out of the lodge, there was an audible gasp. <laughs> they, I hope we'll pull it off. No, we have a, we have a over 1,000 page CD set that's due tomorrow. And I'm here. <laughs> um, and we're working with Fluidity, uh, who's a fountain designer out of uh, Los Angeles, because this is kind of Los Angeles, isn't it? So here's a study model of that, of that Miss Mountain flowing down to the water. These are terraces. This is, it's not really like this anymore, but essentially it is. You see the jets were actually modeling the water in the grotto, which is way too grotto-like in this version. This is the big play garden. Here's a later version of it at a larger scale. This is John Zack, he's our model guru. He's an artist who thought he would never get a job and now has been working in the office for 15 years as the model master. We make all of these things ourselves, though. The designers work on the models. John just keeps them from, you know, cutting their fingers off and stuff. Um, again, visioning moving out into the water. This is an earlier version of that. Sometimes you have to kind of capture an idea when you don't really have it figured out yet. This, I hate this drawing. This is like a ridiculous made-up drawing of a play garden in the woods because that's what we knew we wanted to do and we needed to have it for a public meeting. But play landscapes take an immense amount of work, like exponential. And um, you, can't, uh, 
you can't have it done in, with everything else at the same time. So here, here is some pictures of working on the, on the uh, play landscape at uh, one quarter of an inch equals a foot. This model is about 20 feet square, and, or 15 feet square. And um, we then made this, and then John packed it up and sent it to Tulsa, and I showed it to donors. Um, and of course, they love looking at stuff like this. So that play garden is here. Um, now we're going to walk down here to the water over the, the pond, they're called Blair Pond, because that site was originally Blair. This bridge is different now. Um, we lot, sometimes look at things in different seasons to talk about seasonality and progr you know, different programming in different seasons. Um, and then this is our boundless landscape. This is actually the land bridge. But no one will know they're going over a highway, much less over a bridge. They'll just, the idea here is to bring your eye up to the sky, and the sky and the land come together, and you have that boundless experience. This is um, another building that Mac is working on, or designed at this point, and it's called the Boathouse, although we're about three stories over the pond and on this public terrace here. And it's wacky, as you can see. These are canoes down here. It's, two, it's three levels. Down here is canoes. Up here is this public terrace with the, uh, connected to a restaurant. And inside here is a, is a secret chamber we call um, the Cabinet of Curiosities. On, we made a hill that, like I said, will be 70 feet higher than the lowest point on the site. And you'll be able to swing and see downtown Tulsa from there the land bridge experience um, from the road. And then coming over the bridge and, uh, and seeing the, the uh, Lakeview Lawn coming down to the Arkansas River. And then finally going through the rest of it, I'll go kind of quickly here. This is uh, another land bridge where we have something called the Sky Garden. Again, it doesn't look anything like this. is an early idea of a garden about the sky. Um, that part is still the same, but nothing else is the same except for we're still using red cedars. Uh, working on that sky garden, which is right here, and how it would fold down to the river. Mike getting in virus and I'm taking this picture. And then a garden that we made that would connect up to the sky garden, which was inspired by a local rock formation in Chandler Park. That we called this, shamelessly, the Four Seasons Garden, just to make them like it. <laughs> I shouldn't tell you that. <laughs> and uh, a later development of the Four Seasons Garden, um, because basically you're between a neighborhood and a highway here. So the idea of a contained series of spaces that you moved at and moved through and didn't feel like you were in a traffic island, basically, is what the idea was. Um, and looking at that again um, in the model shop at a different scale. Um, and then more of that. And then tectonics of, of stone construction and how pieces are going to come together because this all needs to be made out of quarried stone. So this, we made these models and we wound up bringing these models to bid meetings with the masons to talk about our ideas of construction and then the masons who were being consulted by the construction manager on how to make it had really interesting ideas about the construction of it and using the stone as a formwork for the concrete core, which we are now actually doing. OK. Um, so two other uh, landscapes in a different category. This is really about reusing a site, um, uh, these, a former margin. This is Bloomingdale Trail, and then um, uh, also Brooklyn Bridge Park. But this idea of these former margins that, that uh, Allegheny River from Park was an early example of, um, and how it's almost because of their marginal um, relationship to the city originally that they now have a lot of utility because they become connecting elements. And uh, so this is an elevated rail track through a neighborhood in Chicago. It connects kind of gentrifying um, Wicker Park with um, 
a very ungentrified Logan Square. And there's a, been a mix of industry and housing along this path for a very long time. And uh, we found these historic images of them building the Bloomingdale Trail in the middle of Bloomingdale Avenue. And you see the formwork here for these massive concrete uh, walls. So they're making these walls and then they fill this up level and the trains ran on top over bridges here, okay? These things became very part of our site investigation and became very inspirational to the final design. There are these overpasses also that we had to deal with and then things falling apart. So how do you take this piece of industrial infrastructure and turn it into a public amenity? And I was telling an architecture class earlier today, with these infrastructural elements in cities and converting them into public space, my fundamental question is, what do you keep and what do you change? Because you can't change everything, and you can't keep everything because it's made for trains. So what do you keep and what do you change? What's appropriate? What's interesting? What's intriguing? What's problematic? That's sort of the operative question that you're asking yourself. And uh, what we realized was there was this volume of soil here, unlike the High Line in, in, in New York, which is a bridge, there was this volume of soil. And they had been thinking of making this park for 10 years, making this site into a park for 10 years. But no one had thought of regrading that soil to make a more interesting experience and to facilitate access. And when I said that in a public meeting, there was another gasp. So the, I, this was the slides that we used to show that. We said, you know, right now it's flat. It's kind of ecologically consistent. It's boring. Also, you can't get onto it. What we'd like to do is regrade that between the bridges, which would give us uh, ecological gradients, and then also facilitate access, and then start to reveal the structure as a giant found object. I would say the, the conceptual artist Gordon Matta Clark was an inspiration, or not consciously here, but because I saw him many decades ago, but you should look up his work. He did these violent um, things to broken houses where he would chop the house in half and like reveal the structure by doing that. And uh, that's sort of our inspiration here. So our thought was if we vary, these are early concept sketches, if we varied the section between the walls, you could start to create all of these, all, all of these different experiences and different ecologies. Um, so I just run you from the length from Ridgeway down here to Wicker Park. Um, it's nicely right at a YMCA at this end, but this is what it looks like now at the end of a cul-de-sac. So the after view, you'll be invited up. There's an elevated prospect for looking down the length of it. There are places where there's some width, 60 feet wide, rather rare, but a few places. Um, and what you see is this idea of creating a series of very distinct plant communities or plant expressions that are loosely based on communities or ecological associations along the length um, of, the, of, the, of the site to kind of give variety and work with the grading and the, and the experience. This is an overlook that overlooks a greenway to Humboldt Park that we made into um, a public seating that looks out and then rose, raised the walkway up behind the seating so people on their bikes can look over the benches and see out. Here's, we worked with very creative uh, structural engineers who had the idea of recycling a bridge from one location into another. This is at Western Avenue, which is a main street. They wanted to raise this bridge to get more clearance to comply with state regulations. And these things stink too, right? And that's a little discontinuous in the sidewalk, right? So there was some things to improve here. So they thought, let's take this girder bridge from the other end that we don't need and bring it down here and span this in one shot, get rid of the legs, raise them up to give you the height, and then I thought we should cut behind the abutments and bring the sidewalk straight through, cut one side of the walls off and zigzag up and over um, like that. And so that's a drawing. That's actually the girder in place, they, and they're cutting the wall here. You can see the cut, and they cut it away already here. Here they're cutting it down revealing the structure. So as we slice through the wall, it gets thicker and thicker. So you'll be walking on top of the wall eventually as you get down. 
and then uh, you know the girder in place there. So that's under underway. Uh, another idea the structural engineers had was they wanted to raise this bridge and get rid of these legs. And they thought, well, let's reuse the girder but hang it from new trusses, uh, which I thought was great. Our idea was to bring the park up and over here. At this location, we, we tie into various neighborhood parks wherever we can to try to make connections. So we're, we grade down at this location grade down and then down into the park here creating an art plaza here and then at the end the, the trail comes along and on one on the other side from the trail here is a park you can see the trees in it this side the parks department bought and so my thought was to ex just blast the park right through the trail here and make a hole and have the lawn of the park flow through and connect the two sides and make a new make the park uh, the trail into a, a thin bridge at that moment and and then at the very end this is the bridge they recycled and brought down to the other end at the very end it ends and you spiral down and then there's this big road here and then a highway behind me so in order to wall that off we have this giant sound wall that we're making green wall um, and then uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park is a, a, my final thing I'll talk about this is um, a, uh, a major urban transformation of an uh, industrial site. And again, this is what the site was like. What do you keep and what do you change? This is a huge undertaking. It's $350 million when, it w when it's all done. There are piers. There's an elevated expressway. The city is up 60 feet high in, along a lot of the site here. A lot of expensive things to either replace or, or um, build over. There was an interesting thing where nature was kind of taking over some of the site and there's a kind of wonderful uh, poetry to that that we wanted to capture in the design. It extended out into the water in a dramatic way, had a fantastic borrowed landscape. But this whole section here was that where those hi that highway is, you see the highway right here? And so we, this is the Brooklyn Bridge, this is the Manhattan Bridge and the site extends about 1.3 miles along this whole length. Some of it's on piles these are subway tunnels that go underneath it that we have to be recognized. This is a place where we can connect to the city. This is a place where we can connect to the city and over here as well. And this is the plan. One of the challenges of this project was that we needed to design a park, figure out what the maintenance of the park would be and the cost of that maintenance would be. Then design, an, at the same time, design an urban design plan that would contain the park and include within it some development parcels that would throw off revenue because they would become part of the park project that would throw off revenue that would pay for and match the 15 million dollars we figured we needed annually to um, maintain the park and we were allowed to use 20 percent of the area to do that ultimately we were able to only use we were able to reduce that to 10 percent of the area and half of that area was actually buildings that already existed. There was a building up here called the Empire Stores and there's a building down here that both became part of the park and, and wound up being part of that solution. Um, and the, uh, you know, the site itself was bereft of any kind of ecology, but a lot of um, transformation of the site happened through topography and thinking about the site's relationship to the water and to the rain and, and the soil. We regraded the site and reconfigured it to add a whole collection of uh, microecologies, I guess you could call them, that would support different plant communities and start to add diversity to the length of the, of the park. We really thought a lot about time and landscape. The, uh, the landscape, uh, you know, I was, I always joke about how you uh, go to, um, crate and barrel and you buy a couch you know and it's like in a nice loft space and then you take it home and the couch is like four inches too big and it's like a complete disaster right it's like ruins everything because it's like four inches too big but landscape architects we have to design things that change like 25 times in size not four inches so that's an interesting thing and and it happens over time and it's slow and so what 
The idea that the scale of the trees is going to change dramatically over time and we want it to look good when we plant it and then we want it to look good in 75 years was an operative um, thought. We wind up developing these hedgerows throughout the length of the park that preserve these green spaces to vistas, to the Statue of Liberty and back to the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and, but then also provided instant shade along the pathways. There's a whole collection of, um, these are some of the other types of spaces that are there. This is the water garden. This is a, 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 called the marsh garden, which is a play space about nature. This is a, a, water, uh, a water garden that filters storm water that runs off the site, which is stored for recycling um, and reuse on the site. We created, um, in this instance, new edges to the water, be new relationships between the land and the water. Here we carved into landfill to create a salt marsh, um, which is a Spartina community, um, one of the only terrestrial plants that can grow in salt water. Um, one of these um, moments here, which we wound up calling urban junctions, where the park and the city came together, got a lot of consideration. This kind of moment, this is called Fulton Ferry Landing. Additional connections were made, including this new bridge that connected an existing park that went up to Brooklyn Heights and down here. This is the bridge built and in place. Um, this is back at looking at those kind of connections between the, uh, the park site itself, rethinking all of the structure of the edges of the site to make it more resilient, make it lower maintenance, and kind of create gradients into the water instead of um, uh, uh, you know, vertical uh, cantilevers that most of it was. We removed areas, removed deck to kind of take them off the maintenance rolls. And then we really thought a lot about if the Maggie Daly is wacky in its skating ribbon, Brooklyn Bridge Park is wacky in its kayak programming, where we really have developed a whole series of ways to get into the water in kayak um, between different places in the park including making new beaches that bend the, uh, uh, lower the city down into the water. This is the best way to launch a kayak if you're an inexperienced kayaker. There's a, there's a nature island out here. It's an isolated island of, uh, for birds. Um, and we cut two of the piers off to create a canal that you can canoe through. Um, that's related to this idea of structural economy where the thought was that if we really had a close reading of the site and we looked at the capacity of the site and its structural, its structural capacity, we could start to propose program that worked best in different locations once we knew what the programs were that people needed. So soccer was very needed, um, but also park experience uh, in a more traditional sense was very needed, and abating the sound from the BQE was very needed. These, th that section evolved into something like this in parts of the park which we designed with sound engineers using computer modeling. We get, um, it actually performed, we get a, a seven decibel reduction in this park. If you know about decibels, they're actually um, exponential. So they, it's very significant, seven decibels. It actually works better than design though. The idea of using that slope to create a kind of uh, bird preserve on the back of the park here. And then some of these deck spaces, the structural spaces, they became opportunities for other kinds of experiences. This is called the Picnic Peninsula. It has um, hundreds of feet of, of picnic tables and, and grills, and uh, you get all kinds of mixing of crowds out there. There's three full-size soccer fields on Pier 5 uh, with artificial turf. They're lighted, and they're used until 1 o'clock in the morning every day of the year. Um, all three of them. There is a sand volleyball here on Pier 6, also lighted. And the setting of this um, surreal setting in, w to have this kind of thing going on with that in the backdrop is, is in incredible. The, um, the, then on the land, in the topographic areas, we're able to create hills and plant, uh, have lush experiences. Also, um, weaving together uh, the circulation into the space, having a lot of people use this, actually a relatively small amount of space. And I'll just talk a uh, little bit about the, 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 the play garden here at the end of it. 
you know, you come in at Atlantic Avenue, we have something called Swing Valley, which is a garden of swings. Slide Mountain, which, where we made a hill with slides built into it. A sandbox village here and a water lab. This is a view in, this, in, this, in the garden. All the flowers in here are flowers people would have at their beach house. If they had a beach house, but they probably don't have a beach house, that's why they're coming here. Um, and uh, you get this incredible social mixing. Sometimes places are taken over and used in ways that you didn't anticipate, and then you can learn from that. That happened here in Swing Valley. We wound up using this kind of form in Chicago to make a totally different kind of space. This is the water lab uh, where the, there's kind of all kinds of ways of manipulating water and, and it intermixes with rocks and plants, gets crowded. And uh, the Mar Marsh Garden, which is a kind of, this is for the misanthropes. Um, and then this is uh, the Slide Mountain area where we use lush planting, a lot of bamboo and magnolias and London Plains to create a kind of almost a maze with, with slides and stairs and towers and climbing structures. So that's it. Um, this is, I just wanted to uh, conclude with the um, thought that I want you to try to think about, uh, you know, landscape's medium as the capacity of the, la of the landscape. Um, and think about your projects in, in trying to take, you know, as much advantage of that as possible. And so thank you very much. And I could take questions if you'd like. going to see and hear the stories behind the landscapes from wonderful designers when they come for the Ekdahl lecture. It's a real gift when you share the way you think and the philosophy behind why you do the things that you do. And thank you very much for such a generous presentation. Um, I know that many of you have other obligations, and I want to be sure that those who have questions for Matthew are able to ask those, so, so that we don't have all the seat flapping and backpacks clanking around. Um, those that have other things that you need to do, why don't you go ahead and, and you can go and, and not feel like you're interrupting, and those who have questions right. will stay and have questions for Matthew. That'd be good. Great. That was just wonderful. Oh, good. Thank you. I love hearing the stories behind places. <laughs> yeah. That's, our I, our I, daughter is a big consumer of the Brooklyn Bridge Park. Oh, so, really? Yeah, yeah. she oh, lives she in the city. And oh, she lived good. in Brooklyn before. And so um, I think she finally was like, that's why mom loves what all this is about. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. What does she do? Yeah. She's a, a, a book cover designer for Little Brown. Neat. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. There's a couple of stories that are like Yeah, come in a little bit if you want. Yeah, I think so. I'll turn this off. Yeah. I gotta get rid of this extra.